Interesting. Good day, my Jay Knights. I am the Austin Reviewer, and today we're going to be looking at the 2007 version of Persuasion by the BBC, as seen here in the case. This is the uh, copy again from my library. Thank you to Edmonton Public Library for having it in stock, and it has to go back to someone else has a hold on it, which is not actually that uncommon. Most of the Jane Austen stuff has a hold on it, either before or shortly after I had put my own on it. All right, so. We're going to go over the synopsis of the movie, then we're going to talk about the cinematography and the uh, elements of it just as a movie by itself, and then we'll talk about the things that they actually changed and how I feel about it as an adaptation. This one got, oddly enough, more notes than uh, the Pride and Prejudice that I just finished doing, but we'll, we'll understand a bit more of that as we go along. So, the synopsis. So the movie opens with Anne Elliot doing a walkthrough and categorizing all the things inside Kelly Nitch Hall as they are preparing to remove from it because it needs to be let, so because their family is in a great amount of debt from the overspending of her father and her eldest sister. She, so she's going through, she's doing all the categorizing, Lady Russell arrives, they talk about the family's financial situation, they go out, talk to her father and her sister, Mr. Shepherd arrives with having a tenant request or proposition of Admiral Croft. Anne is a little bit unnerved by this because Admiral Croft's wife is the sister of Captain Frederick Wentworth. She excuses herself from the conversation, Lady Russell follows up with her, and they have a discussion about the past relationship between Anne and Frederick, in which she refused him on the persuasion mostly of Lady Russell with some slight weight given mostly on Lady Russell's part to the displeasure of Sir Walter on the occasion. They then have supper at which uh, Sir Walter and Elizabeth both make it known that they want Mrs. Clay, the daughter, widowed daughter of Mr. Shepherd, to come with them to Bath. Lady Russell isn't particularly impressed with this since shouldn't Anne be enough companion for Elizabeth, but Anne is at that moment informed by Elizabeth that she is being sent to Upper Cross to care for their third sister, who is, they don't say it in the movie, but she's a bit of a hypochondriac and she considers herself to be ill-used at even the slightest thing that she considers to be a slight. As Anne is departing in the coach cart thing to go to Upper Cross, Admiral and Mrs. Croft arrive at Kellynich and express their wish to become acquainted with Anne Elliot since she is going to be in the neighborhood and is uh, presented at, by Mr. Shepherd as being the only member of the Elliot family with any sense, which is accurate for a lot of reasons, but we will we'll get into that. We'll get into that. So Anne arrives at Upper Cross where Mary is laid out on the sofa complaining about how ill-used she is and how nobody's come to visit her even though she made sure that her husband told them that she was very, very ill. She complains that she can't eat and that they can't go to visit until the people at uh, Upper Cross come to visit Anne, which technically is correct, but they had a very familiar style of intercourse, which kind of made it sort of pointless, but regardless. Uh, the two oldest daughters of the Musgroves, who have just returned from school, come running in to see Anne, mostly ignoring Mary, which is kind of funny. They were never that blatant about it in the book. It was more of a subtle thing, so I'm assuming they did that to be more blatant in the movie about the relationship. Uh, they then all go back to Upper Cross, where they find out from the senior Mr. Musgrove that uh, they are invited, they have invited the Crofts as well as Captain Wentworth to come to Upper Cross for dinner that evening, or the next day. Anne is a little bit nervous about this, of course, because of course she is. She refused him many years ago, and it's kind of hard feelings on all sides. But while they're getting ready to go for the dinner, uh, the oldest son of Mary and Charles is brought in having fallen from a tree and requiring tender, loving care. And conveniently uses this excuse to get out of the dinner, though she does wonder what's going on there and kind of wishes to go. 
So Wentworth arrives the next morning to go shooting with Charles, just in time to kind of overhear the uh, girls talking about him to Anne, though of course they don't actually mention that, but that's kind of what it looks like. He's introduced to Anne. It's all extremely awkward. She's upset and realizes that he still hasn't forgiven her for her refusal so many years ago. They then have a dinner at Kellynich, where again, uh, Mrs. Croft tries to introduce Mr. Went Captain Wentworth and Anne to each other, but they already know each other and it's still all very awkward. The next morning you have uh, Mary and Charles debating with each other while out on a walk with Anne about which one of the girls uh, Mr. Wentworth prefers. At the evening before they had also had a kind of impromptu dance where Anne played the piano, which is exactly how it pretty much always happened in the book. So I did like that, but getting ahead of myself there. They are then met by Mr. Wentworth, or sorry, Captain Wentworth. There's another Mr. Wentworth. He never really appears, though he is mentioned in the movie, so I really should stop doing that. Ha ha ha. So Captain Wentworth arrives, or walks by them, with Louisa and Henrietta, who are going to visit Charles Hayter, who is a cousin of the Musgroves at uh, Winthrop. There we go. Walk over a log and trips. Uh, Charles offers to stay with her, but she won't let him, so he goes on. He and Henrietta then go to call on their cousin because Mary won't go in the house because she thinks that they're too inferior for connections. She wanders off on the pretense of going to find Anne, and Louisa and Captain Wentworth talk about Anne and how she had refused Charles when he had asked her to marry him before he asked Mary a number of years ago. And they talk about inconsistency of character and this, that, and another thing, and uh, how he applauds Louisa for being saying she is of a firm temperament and can't be persuaded to anything once she's made up her mind. Uh, Anne overhears this. After she's composed herself, then she joins them. They all go out, continue along on their walk. Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft happen to ride by in their little... Uh, the word has escaped me now, but it's a little horse-drawn thing. Anne is then persuaded to go along with them because she is tired, so Captain Wentworth basically puts her onto the back of their little buggy thing and away they go. Then they're talking about which of the girls uh, uh, Captain Wentworth prefers. This is again very upsetting for Anne, but she doesn't say anything to them about it. While she's writing in her diary the next day, then Mary comes and informs her that they're all going to be going to Lyme with Captain Wentworth, so away they go. She thinks more about their relationship than what has happened to it. When they're at Lyme, they meet up with uh, Captain Harville. They also meet Captain Bennick and his wife. Captain Bennick is quite love-struck and broken-hearted because the girl he was engaged to for about five years passed away the uh, summer before. So he just reads Merle's poetry. So while everyone else is having all their lively, happy conversation and feeling some kindredness with this poor man, engages him in the topic of, in the book it's in poetry, but they actually talk about the consistency of feeling between men and women and which uh, sex has the better claim to being the longer loving or the more intensely loving. They then go for another walk on the cob where when they're going up the stairs they happen to meet with Mr. Elliot who is the cousin of Anne and Mary and Elizabeth and is the actual heir to the Kelly Nitch estate who will inherit the baronetcy uh, when Sir Walter passes away. She then meets him again in the passageway at their inn on her way to dinner. They then see him outside, they inquire about who he is, they are told. Mary is quite upset that they missed the chance of the introduction, though uh, Anne points out that there shouldn't really be an introduction because they are not on good terms in the family at present because of a slight that he made to Sir Walter when he got married. And they're walking on the cob, this is supposed to be just before they're going home. Louisa wants to be jumped down the stairs, which basically means she jumps off the stairs into Captain Wentworth's arms and he puts her on the ground. He doesn't actually want her to do this here because it's a little more dangerous than doing it off of the stiles out in the field, one because of the height and because of the ground you're leaping onto. She doesn't listen though, she will not be persuaded, she goes back up the stairs, jumps again, but this time the captain misses catching her because she jumps a little too fast and falls and hits her head on the pavement. And gives directions for Captain Bennick to go and fetch a surgeon. They take her to the home of the Harvilles, where uh, Captain Wentworth wants her to stay while he takes Mary and Henrietta back because they're borderline useless. Mary thinks she's ill-used, will hear nothing of it, and so Anne goes back with Henrietta instead. 
they get back inform the parents since there's no one at Upper Cross for Anne to be with she is now going to be on her way to Bath. She arrives at Bath to overhear her father and sister telling Mrs. Clay that she has to stay with them because Anne is really not much of anything to them and they much prefer her company. She is then introduced upon the calling at that very convenient moment of Mr. Elliot who is now reconciled to the family and Mrs. Clay and Elizabeth and Sir Walter are all hoping that he's now struck with Elizabeth who is generally regarded as being much more beautiful than Anne. Captain Wentworth on his own also finds out that the expectation is very great on pretty much all sides that he is going to marry Louisa and he resolves to go away to visit his brother to try to lessen the attraction since he is not actually attracted to Louisa at all. In the pump room, uh, Anne and Lady Russell talk a little bit about Mr. Elliot. She then also ends up talking to Mr. Elliot somewhat about the Mambo stop doing that the uh, relationship between Walt Sir Walter and Mrs. Clay, which they both think should not be going on by any means, and is informed of Louisa is going to be engaged very soon by her uh, uh, brother-in-law Charles. She then goes to visit Mrs. Mrs. Smith, who is an old school friend of hers. Captain Wentworth at this point in time finds out from Captain Harvel that his uh, he is no longer honor bound to Louisa because she and Benick are now engaged. So he goes off to Bath. She then finds out when the ben the uh, Crofts come to visit that it's not Louisa and Captain Wentworth that are engaged, it is her and Captain Benick. She finds out also at this time that Captain Wentworth is actually coming to Bath and she ends up meeting him in a shop in the rain. They then have a music concert at which uh, all of Anne's family basically slights Wentworth but she goes and talks to him before the concert begins. He then hears a rumor that everyone is expecting that Mr. Elliot is going to propose to Anne very soon. He is upset by this and leaves the concert in the very very beginning of it. Anne follows him out asks him if it's not worth staying for. He says there's nothing worth staying for and leaves. Mr. Elliot has followed her out so he takes the opportunity of proposing. Next morning she gets a note from Captain Wentworth saying he's going to call on her around 11. At about the same time Charles and Mary arrive. They're talking and then Captain Wentworth arrives and she introduces them. She calls Captain Wentworth aside. He tells her that the Crofts are making an offer that if she's engaged to Mr. Elliot and they want to use Kellynich as their home that they're willing to vacate it. She then tells Captain Wentworth that he is thoroughly mistaken and that she is not in love, she's not engaged to him, they're not going to be engaged. Lady Russell arrives, Captain Wentworth leaves, she goes to chase after Captain Wentworth, runs into Mrs. Smith again, who tells her about the history of Mr. Elliot, how he only wants to make sure that uh, Sir Walter is not going to get married to anybody else, that he plans to keep Mrs. Clay as a mistress to himself in order to keep her away from Sir Walter, though he does have honest affection for Anne and does genuinely want to marry her. She then goes looking. She arrives at the Admiral's house to find Captain Harville there who gives her a note from Captain Wentworth. She then finds out that he is still in love with her and he wishes to marry her. So she runs off to try to find him. She finds the Crofts and they tell her that he's gone to call uh, at um, the, her father's house. So she runs back that way, runs into Mr. Charles Musgrove and Mr. Wentworth. Charles excuses himself because he wants to go look at a gun by a shop owner and accepts Mr. Wentworth's proposal. They kiss, they have a nice tear run down the tree can, cheek and it's all very touching and then they ride off in a carriage and they arrive and he's got her a wedding present and it is Kelly Nitch Hall and that's the end of the movie. How was it as just a movie? Well in most regards it was actually quite good. They made a very bold decision with the making of this one where they don't, it doesn't appear that they actually have much if any makeup on really any of the characters which it's a very bold mood. It, it does work, it doesn't distract you except for the fact that the lighting is in general quite poor so I don't know if that's in consequence of these other things or what they're trying to do because there's times when they have a lot of candles in a room so you can tell that they're trying to present that as being the lighting source but there's other areas that are lit up in a way that couldn't be being lit by those candles and the overall um, lighting of the movie in general makes it look very very washed out. 
I don't know if that was necessarily an intended thing, but it's a little bit gloomy and makes it seem kind of uh, distracting. The set and locations were quite beautiful. They were very uh, to the time period and uh, same thing with the costumes. The plot development was pretty good. It flowed quite well. It was quite a bit quicker than the pace you get in the book. They moved a number of conversations around, but don't worry, we'll get to that. The mood was excellent. The wardrobe was beautiful. I had a couple of questions here and there about some of the choices they made, but those were mostly made for dramatic effect. So since we're talking about it just as a film here, that that is fully in line with what they're trying to do. Dialogue was well delivered. The acting was for the most part really good. There were one or two moments where it was kind of, huh? What was that? But those were very, very few and for the most part pretty far between. So as far as that goes, they were maybe a little bit distracting when you did notice them, but it was very rarely there to be noticed. And if I hadn't been taking notes, I might not have actually noticed at all. The music and the ambience was actually quite good. They have Anne playing the Moonlight Sonata at one point in time, and being as I am kind of a stickler and knowing that that's a bit of a funny time period, I quickly looked up when uh, Beethoven lived and when more particularly the Moonlight Sonata had been written, and it was written in 1801, so they get a pass on that, well done. So now, how does it do as an adaptation? Well, as I hinted at a little bit earlier, they did move a few things around. So there's kind of a few exposition dumps, mostly near the beginning of the story, that give you some of the history of uh, her relationship with Captain Wentworth, the, the uh, state of the family currently. Um, though the one thing that did strike me as being kind of funny with this is that they do actually have Anne at intervals and at somewhat consistent intervals, which is nice. I have issue with that in a different uh, adaptation of something else, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So they have her writing in a journal or a diary and doing kind of the voiceover of her thoughts. So why, if they were going to do that, they felt the need to do these exposition dumps with other characters who knew about these things beforehand is a little odd to me. Like they don't have uh, Lady Russell voicing her objections to Mrs. Clay on Sir Walter's account until they're in Bath, whereas that was actually one of the reasons why she had encouraged them to go to Bath in the first place. So there's that. They also have a conversation happen between uh, Anne and Captain Bennick when they're in uh, Captain Harville's home that actually takes place near almost the very very end of the book between herself and Captain Harville which when Captain Wentworth who is nearby writing uh, on some business for Captain Harville hears this he writes his own response in a letter which contains his proposal to Anne and he then finds a way to covertly get it into her possession all within that same set. So they did have her getting the proposal in a letter, which is how it happened in the book, but the circumstances around her getting the letter were very, very different. Uh, similarly, uh, while the comment that Mr. Elliot makes to Anne about his hoping that her name will never change, which is a direct hint to about him uh, proposing. He never actually proposes in the book, so they actually have him blatantly do it here, which is the cause of some of the hullabaloo. Uh, the other weird choice they made, though I suppose I can guess why they did it this way, was in the book, Mrs. Smith is almost immobile. Uh, she had rheumatic fever and they say it settled into her legs, so she basically doesn't have much use of the ability to walk around. So every time Anne saw her, it was pretty much always at her tiny little rented room. And one of her bigger complaints with Mr. Elliot beyond character, because she acknowledges that that could have changed or improved over time, but is the fact that he refuses to take the trouble of being the executor of her husband's will, which is actually keeping her in poverty, because if he would actually uh, take the trouble of doing what he's honor bound supposed to do, then she wouldn't be in the circumstance that she's in, at least financially. She also provides Anne with some actual examples of his behavior in the past, along with a couple of letters that had been, a letter that had been written to her husband that further shows Mr. Elliot's disdain for having the name of Elliot and that he doesn't want anything to do with the family. And it's only now because he's rich 
and he's decided that he wants the title because you can't buy that, that he's trying to reconcile himself to the family. Uh, Anne is believable because she's in her uh, late 20s. I think in the book they actually have her at 28, but in the uh, in the movie they've chosen to make her 27, which close enough. She does look believable at that age. There's times where they cast actresses or actors that are they look much, much older or much, much younger than the characters they're supposed to be playing. I did notice that for the uh, two Musgrove boys, Mary's uh, two sons, uh, Charles and Henry, they made them quite a bit older than what they actually are in the book, but I guess you can have problems with child actors, but honestly they're hardly in the movie at all. They're in the book a little more than they are in the movie, but it's not much of a distinction. I did notice with the camera that it was pretty shaky. Like they did a lot of, you could tell someone was holding it and they didn't really have a stabilizer, which worked really well for some shots, but was just really distracting in other ones. Um, I found it quite funny and I've seen a lot of comments on this uh, by other people looking at it, that there's this one scene where she's going through the house at the beginning and she's doing her cataloging and she comes up the stairs and she's walking through this hallway and there's a lady there Stand, a servant standing there with a tray with an ink pot on it. So she gets some more ink for her pen and continues on her way. And you can see the servant for a few, several more seconds and she just stands there. She was standing there when Anne came up and she was standing there when she walked by. And it's the, the funniest thing, it's like they have a servant just to stand there with an ink pot with the, it's, it's quite odd, it's quite hilarious. It's, doesn't make a ton of sense, like I guess with the flow and stuff, but the fact that they just have her standing there afterwards is just hilarious. As I say before, Lady Russell knew about Mrs. Clay uh, before they were going to Bath. She had actually been involved in the decision of them deciding to actually let Kelly Nitch in the first place, which is another difference, is that they start the movie with them preparing to remove, but they don't actually have a tenant yet, whereas it wasn't until they had actually signed the lease with Admiral Croft that they actually did all their removing and actually went off to Bath and had to find a place there and all that kind of fun stuff. So that was a bit different. Uh, Anne is believably discomposed. It's hinted at and kind of understood in the book, though they never directly describe exactly how she's, what she looks like when she's discomposed, but it's believable enough that she is uh, discomposed, but also you can kind of see why some people wouldn't necessarily notice it or wouldn't take as much account of it. So that I thought that was quite well done. I did like what they did with the diary. There's no mention of her keeping a diary, but you're hearing her thoughts when you're reading the novel. So I think it was actually a very good way to actually get that across, though it does make some of the exposition drops really, really odd. I don't know why they did both of those things. I think they would have done better with just one or another. Uh, anyway, uh, I thought that Admiral Croft should have been a little more jovial. He's quite He's a bit of a joker. He's a little absent-minded almost uh, in the novel. He's one of the, in my opinion, one of the best characters in it. Similarly, Captain Wentworth is quite serious most of the time, and while he was quite serious and almost cold with Anne, he was very agreeable with pretty much everybody else, and I don't think they really showed that quite as much as they could. There's occasional hints of it, but yeah, you're given more to understand based on what the other characters are saying about him and his behavior with the Miss Musgroves than opposed to what he himself is doing with them. So I think that was a bit of a problem, at least for me, but anyway. Uh, Mary was done perfect, though. The way she's constantly viewing herself as being ill-used, and if you can talk her in just the right way, then she'll snap out of it was quite funny. That's exactly how she is in the book. She's she's funny. I... I I don't really like her as a character, but she's funny to watch. You know that old saying of everything's funny as long as it's happening to somebody else. She's very much one of those. So one of the weird things that I found is in the scene where uh, little Charles Musgrove is carried in because he's fallen out of the tree, we see that Anne is getting ready to uh, get dressed to go to the dinner. So she's in her room and she's holding up dresses and trying to figure out what she's wearing. The one odd thing that I noticed with her dress was that the straps that went over her shoulders uh, from her stays were about the same thickness as a bra strap, which was rather odd to me. Like I'm actually wearing stays right now and you can see the size of the strap. It's a fairly significant holder. Um, 
They also have her wearing short stays, which is what I'm wearing because I don't have a set of long ones. I usually just combine a corset with them uh, for when I'm going out. But if you were going out somewhere, you would not have worn short stays. I'm probably going to have to make a video on this in uh, the Culture of the Times, uh, excuse my uh, impertinent curiosity series. But anyway, so she should have been wearing uh, a pair of long stays underneath the shift and then she would have had her dress on over that but she puts on kind of this little um coat sweater thing and goes out in her underwear to see what is going on with little charles and as much as she loves him i do not know that the anne elliot in the book would have done something like that uh, similarly there are frequent moments where she, they're outside and other things like this or they're in a ball or similar situation where they're out in public and there's no gloves on the men or on the women and they should all have been wearing gloves so as far as the fashion of the time goes there's a bit of a problem there otherwise the dresses the coats the uh, neck cloths everything was actually very very period appropriate and did actually look like something that would have belonged in that time period you see the ladies with the stockings they got their uh, shoes on though why Anne in one of the last scenes is wearing shoes suitable for running out of the house and running well, quite literally all over bath when she's in the house is a little strange especially when everyone else is around her is mostly wearing slippers because she would have been wearing slippers but uh, I digress not really actually that's what the whole point of this thing is there was some very nice jobs with the cinematography to express uh, Anne's feelings of anxiety over certain situations or her loneliness or her sadness. Maybe that's part of why they had the lighting so muted, though. If that was the case, why they didn't then brighten it up after she got the proposal? It's kind of beyond me. The praise that the Miss Musgroves heap on Mr. Wentworth when they get back from uh, the dinner is very accurate to the book. Like, a lot of the dialogue is actually straight out of the book not always in the same spot that it was in in the book but it is all straight out of the book which is actually quite enjoyable uh, though they do give some lines from some characters to other characters which is a little bit more why did you do that but anyway oh yes they have real english country dancing and i could actually recognize a bunch of the moves they were doing it wasn't necessarily um the moves that they were doing i'm familiar with to a different english country dance and the music wasn't correct for that one but with the style of English country dancing, and I'm going to have to do a video on this sometime soon, was actually very accurate with her playing the piano because that's what she would do. She didn't dance, she just played, and she'd play for hours for their amusement, which was one of the best things she could do as far as the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove uh, were consi uh, considered. Mary's pride is spot on. That's exactly how she was in the book. They did something very dramatic with her where she falls off the log and that's why she gets briefly left behind. But that doesn't actually make, for one thing, it did not happen at all in the, uh, in the book. The reason why um, uh, Louisa and Mr. Wentworth get separated from her and why Mary gets separated from her is that they decide they're going to pick nuts. She finds a nice spot for Mary to sit. Mary doesn't want to sit because she's sure that Louisa has found a better spot to sit, so she goes off in search of them. And while Anne is sitting there alone waiting for somebody to come back is when she hears uh, Louisa and Captain Wentworth talking about her in the uh, uh, shrubbery and such behind her. This, the dialogue they have in there is basically lifted straight out of the book, which well done was well done uh the relationships between the characters are believable i do think that wentworth does captain wentworth needs to be a little bit more lively to be fully in line with the character but overall the character portrayals are very very good uh sir walter is spot on mary is spot on elizabeth is a little bit more kind of childish and almost bratty in this one than she was in the book but i can i can understand why they did it that way it's a a bit of a compliment to the artistic directors. I don't know if they needed to do it, but they I think they just wanted to heighten the drama on that one. Uh, when they went on their way to Lyme, uh, Mr. Musgrove and Mr. Wentworth went in one carriage while the ladies were all in another, so he was not on horseback like they had him in the uh, movie. Anne's drawing out of Benwick is accurate, though their conversation in the book was actually about poetry because he was reading a lot of really morose poetry because his heart was broken with the uh, passing of his fiance, so Anne encourages him to read 
uh, more prose. So the conversation that she has with Captain Harville is very accurate to the conversation that she and Captain Harville had after this occasion when they're out on the cob. They didn't show the cob for quite a while, so I was at first a little bit worried that they had just gone to some random seaside place and forgotten about it, but it was kind of important to the story, so when they did finally show it, I was like, yes, yes, finally, good, yay, we have the cob. The lady can fall down the stairs and break her head. Anyway, I would have liked if they would have lingered a little bit more on Mr. Elliot's taking notice of Anne Elliot when uh, they happened to meet at the cob. They have him kind of lingering his gaze on her, but it's in a very wide shot. And then when they show a closer shot of him kind of looking after them, you don't really know that that's exactly what he's looking at. So the fact that he did take notice of Anne, which was very pointed and quite well canvassed by the book, is kind of glossed over a bit. And I think that does a little bit of a disservice to it. So then when she meets him in the hallway, you barely have any idea who this guy even is because you didn't really see him that closely. And he takes notice of her there again. And I don't think that, that quite happens very well in this one. Um, they also don't have him talking about when he gets to Bath and he's talking to her about the trip to Lyme. He doesn't mention about how uh, he had heard their party in the next room over having dinner and he wished he could have joined it and his resolve to never uh, neglect questioning about who the party is because if he had heard that there were Elliots in it then he would have tried to get itself introduced. Uh, the one uh, when they have her jumping off of the uh, stairs at the cob and falls down they actually show, if you look into the bonnet when she's laying on the ground, they press a handkerchief to the back of her head. Um, they actually show it so it looks like she actually has a visible injury in the back of her head. She got a bump, but she did not. there was no blood or anything. Um, they did it much more for the drama of it as opposed to how it exactly played out in the book with Mary clinging and being hysterical to her husband, uh, Henrietta almost fainting onto him. Um, Benwick and Wentworth having next to no idea and just being frantic and then Anne having to direct everybody what to do not necessarily getting down there with her but just directing everyone and how they have to go about it. Uh, the decision is made that uh, they want Anne to stay because she'd be the best one to care for Louisa but Mary won't hear of it because she has better claim to Louisa and refuses to be left there without her husband so Wentworth takes uh, Anne and Henrietta home it's at this point in time that she asks him to send her knowledge of how Louisa is doing because she's going straight away to Bath, which is not how it happened. Uh, she stayed for several days with the Musgroves at Upper Cross before going to Killinich Lodge, which is where Lady Russell was for an amount of time. She then saw the, uh, um, the Crofts there a number of times with Lady Russell. They also had promise of Captain Benwick coming to see them, but he never did. Uh, before Lady Russell then took Anne to Bath. Uh, Mr. Elliot is suitably charming for uh, what he's supposed to be. It is just the right amount of him being charming where it's believable, but also just that little bit that's kind of, I'm not sure I trust you, which is what it needs to be. And since they have to communicate that visually instead of uh, just through Anne's thoughts. It's kind of a good thing they did it this way. They actually show when Mr. Wentworth finds out about uh, the expectation of the Musgroves and the Crofts and pretty much everyone else that he's going to marry Louisa. But this is very disturbing to him because he doesn't actually want to marry Louisa. He doesn't realize he's been this unguarded, but he realizes that he's actually honor bound to her now. So he's a little bit uh, nervous about this. So he goes to visit his brother which happens, though we don't actually learn about it until quite a bit later, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, Lady Russell and Anne are walking about the pump rooms, just talking about Mrs. Clay and the problems with her. Again, this happened much, much earlier in the book, like basically at the very, very start of the book, before you even had basically any of this action going. She then meets um, Mr. Elliot, and they talk, and their conversation is also a kind of a direct lift out of the novel, which was nice. They talk about the difference between good company and the best company, where Anne says that good company is people of great conversation and intelligence and uh, that are more your people you consider worth spending time with. Mr. Elliot points out that that's not good company, that's the best company, and that good company only requires breeding, uh, rank, and intelligence, but uh, intelligence is kind of optional. <laughs> I guess they, they, they use the word education, but let's face it, they probably mean intelligence. 
but in this sequence they have him kiss her hand in public with neither of them wearing gloves they wouldn't have done that they're both in the upper society kind of idea they wouldn't have done that in a public room the amount of scandal you'd be inviting by doing something like that she wouldn't have allowed it even if he was willing to do it and this offends Elizabeth and she gets all curt and short with Anne on occasions after that it's kind of funny to watch because she never clued in I don't think that he actually preferred Anne she didn't really listen to any of the rumors or anything so anyway uh, they have this huge amount of confusion about who Louisa is getting engaged to with Anne and both between her and uh, Charles who sends her the initial uh, information about it and between Wentworth and uh, um, Captain Harville which was rather funny I thought because I I just finished reading Persuasion and I don't get that impression it was a surprise that she had gotten herself engaged to him but what distressed Anne about the engagement was not that oh uh, Captain Wentworth is engaged it was the fact that she was worried that he would think himself poorly used and uh, by the lady that by all intents and purposes he was basically courting according to everybody else so that's where her concern comes into and that's what she actually asks uh, her um, Mrs. Croft and Admiral Croft about uh, most of the conversation that um, Captain Wentworth has with Captain Harville when he's talking about this before he finds out that uh, Louisa is engaged to someone that's not him is actually from the conversation that he and Anne had after he had proposed so most of that dialogue is book original but it's just again in a different place uh, Mrs. Russell's hopes for Mr. Elliot are accurate to the book uh, when they're going to go to the Darwimples um, for a dinner kind of a thing and Anne refuses to go because she's already engaged to go with Mr. Smith her father's outburst about it is accurate to the book but Anne does not present the basic slight that she does against Mrs. Clay at that moment it's mentioned in the book but it's not said though Mrs. Clay does leave the room because she's actually the one that thinks it and Mrs. Croft visit in Bath they tell her that uh, Benick is the one that's engaged to Louisa uh, she gets a story about this from Admiral Croft but she already knows about it and she knows that it's Benick that she's engaged to so I I see where they're trying to take some inspiration from there they changed some things but there is some almost precedent for it but not quite uh, the shop meeting and didn't know that Wentworth was actually in town at that time she happened to see him on the road so she was able to be a bit prepared for when he came in he was very surprised to find her there and that's actually the first time that we see his discomposure around her all the other times he was prepared going in Mr. Wentworth being very jealous of Mr. Elliot is also accurate to the book and quite funny uh, both at there and then at the uh, uh, concert later in the evening though he he did leave between the two sets so he stayed for a whole set and neither of them would have left in the middle and or start of a set that just you wouldn't do that again these are high society people this they're conscious of these kind of social faux pas so she did talk to him he was extremely jealous of Mr. Elliot because he had heard some of the rumors and he had seen the behavior of him to Anne so he was understandably a little bit upset so he did talk to her there and then he left in the kind of the intermission in something of a huff she wasn't particularly pleased with this happening and she was a little bit upset but and she did find Mr. Elliot's talking to her afterwards to be a very unwelcome uh, happening she, she wished him away very greatly but he didn't propose he didn't propose he didn't propose and then they have Mr. Wentworth or Captain Wentworth coming to give Anne the offer from Admiral Croft that if she's going to marry Mr. Elliot they're going to uh, leave Kellynich and allow them to move in and be the master and mistress of it and cancel their lease basically again that did not happen it did not happen that no offer made they may have heard about some of this but they, they never offered that it's not how it would have worked 
Ah! Mrs. Smith is on the street. She wouldn't have been on the street. Mrs. Smith was basically housebound. She would not have been in the street. Moreover than that, at first, because she thinks that Anne is in love with him, she doesn't want to sink his character, so she actually kind of praises him and then hopes for Anne's assistance with getting Mr. Elliot to actually perform his duties as the executor of the executor of the will. When she finds out that Anne doesn't love him, only then, and after some very careful consideration, does she reveal his character to her. This all takes place in her room. It also all takes place before the proposal. Or any notes, or any of that stuff. Anyway. And then she knows about Mrs. Clay. The thing with Mrs. Clay was a surprise to basically everyone. Maybe she did know about it, but she didn't tell Anne about it. <sighs> because he was not planning on keeping her as a mistress until he found out he wouldn't be getting Anne. It's then that he actually took that step. But <laughs> the original plan that he had was he would marry Anne and put into the marriage articles that Sir Wil Walter was not allowed to marry Mrs. Clay. That was his method of going about it. He did love Anne, but he was not going to keep a mistress on her. He ended up doing that after the fact because when he found out he wouldn't be getting her and he just wanted to keep Mrs. Clay away from uh, Sir Walter, but that's not how it happened. At least they de did have Mr. Wentworth's proposal being by letter, though the circumstance around it was completely different because they were actually in uh, the house or the rooms that were being rented uh, by uh, Mrs. Musgrove, or is it Lady Musgrove? I'm gonna double check that. Yeah, it is Mr. Musgrove. But she's got, they've got her running all over Bath. All over Bath. Everywhere. She runs uh, from, uh, it's gone. So she runs, she runs all over Bath. She runs from Camden Place to the where the Crofts are staying. She runs from there to where you would go to take the waters, or basically the bathhouses. She then runs from there all the way back to Camden Place. Now I could actually go and, because most of these are actual locations in Bath, I could actually go and look it up where the heck they are and give you the actual distance. But they've got her running around like crazy. You've got people tipping their hats and nodding to her. She's not responding to any of them. I mean, the amount of slights she was issuing on that run is kind of ridiculous. Not, not to mention the fact that she's a lady who is running around Bath by herself, without gloves, and without a, anything on her head. This is a very interesting movie. Um, she arrives, runs into Charles Musgrove, her brother-in-law, who's talking with Captain Wentworth. He says she needs to get home, but he needs to go and look at this gun thing, which did happen in the book, but it happened that he was going to walk her home from where his mother and sister were staying. And it is when they are walking home that they meet Captain Wentworth. He entrusts her to his care and he goes off to see the gun. And then they have their conversation and they talk about their own feelings and what they've been feeling since seeing each other back again and what they wish they should have done or could have done. And so it's, yeah. But they have a very romantic scene and they kiss out in the open again with no gloves or hats on on either of them in the middle of the street in Bath. What? Just what? No. Uh, anyway. And they go straight from there to them driving up and he's got her Kellynich Hall as a gift. That There's no mention of them doing that. No mention of it whatsoever. In fact, I think it's actually kind of blatantly mentioned differently. They have none of the aftermath of uh, Lady Russell finally accepting Captain Wentworth, him kind of acknowledging her and learning to not think quite so ill of her. Uh, her father and sister, because he is now a captain, they they think she's uh, not the best marriage still, but her dead father's glad to be rid of her. They don't have any of the fallout from uh, Mr. Elliot when she's gone. They skip over a lot of that stuff. They think they tried to touch on it before. They don't have much for any discussion by the two of them about what passed between them and... Yeah, so that was the movie. I think that the um, the moving around of the conversations I can somewhat kind of understand, I suppose, but I'm still not actually convinced about them because the the moving of them just marks a very direct departure from the book. That's really all that it does. The effect of them maybe is similar, but the sequence of it 
is kind of odd and it kind of ruins the one sort of surprise that is in the persuasion because you don't find out that Captain Wentworth um, still loves her. There is still some cordial feelings that he wrestles against. You can see that earlier in the book, but you do not know that he still actively loves her and kind of pines after her until the scene where he writes her the letter and kind of slides it toward her when no one else is looking just before leaving the room. And that's the letter that she gets. So the fact that they don't, they, they expose all this stuff, like they have, they show things that he mentions to her that happen after his proposal is accepted and they're walking about after um, she's had the letter and after they meet in the street and all that. So they're, those things did happen, but you don't see them in the novel until basically the very, very end. And I think that that actually takes a lot of the um, suspense and some of the romance out of it because you know that she still loves him. You know that she's not going to accept Mr. Elliot. You know that now that he's going to try to offer for her, so and you know that she'll accept him if he does. So it just takes pretty much all of the uh, intrigue, if you will, or the what if out of it. I think that must be why they put in her running all over the place. Oh, what if she misses him? What if she doesn't find him? What if he leaves? But that's not what happened. So this one started out, I think, decently strong. There were a few kind of moments in the middle. It's like, oh, what? Okay, I, I guess. And then the ending was kind of, that's not wrong, but it's certainly not correct to the book either. A lot of the circumstances they had in there were very similar to the book, but they just moved stuff around and in some really weird ways. They had char some characters knowing things that they didn't. They had other characters that should have known things that didn't. And yeah, it's still the persuasion story. I will, I will give it that. It is still recognizable as persuasion, which there have been other things that have been adapted that aren't recognizable as their source material. So as far as that goes, it's not the worst thing that I've seen, but uh, let's actually get into the uh, scoring of the case, shall we? So how does this actually fare when stacked as a movie and against uh, its actual source material? It did considerably better than uh, the last one I did. So the uh, set and locations, I'm going to just read it off of my notes here so I don't read something wrong. So the set and location got a 3, this is just as a movie. Plot development got a 2, flow got a 2, effects got a 3. The acting quality I gave it a 2, there were a couple of people that were a little bit off, but for the most part it was actually quite good. Dialogue delivery was very well done, I gave that a 3. The mood of it I gave a 3, the wardrobe I gave a 3, the lighting I gave a 1 because there were some issues with it. Music and ambience got a 3. So that gives us a total of the 30 possible points in that category. Uh, 25. Now for it as an adaptation. So the um, five categories we have for society or the setting, the society at the time got a two, the language got a three, the entertainment got a three, history I gave a three, the wardrobe I gave a two mostly due to that odd scene with her in her underwear because that was odd and then there was also the problem with the gloves so like the dresses they're wearing the main parts of their outfits are accurate but the uh just the subtle little things that would have been the polish on top of it they missed so it lost some there uh for the plot the plot was still decently logical and somewhat well expressed the accuracy uh fell off the boat so that only got a one uh the flow i gave a two it felt a little quick and kind of artificially pushed in some places to me. Uh, mostly good, but still not, not perfect. Uh, characters. I gave the character accuracy a two because there are some characters that I think should have been a little more jolly or charming that were a little more flat. There were, but then there were other ones that were basically spot on. So it was a little bit more of a mixed bag that way. Everyone was still passable. There's nothing in it that kind of offends your sensibility as a uh, the viewing public of the ability of the actors. 
Uh, the communication of the characters was very good. Their motives were fairly clear. Their personalities were, for the most part, spot on, again, with some uh, difficulty with uh, the uh, lack of juvialness with some of them. Their dialogue was spot on. Pretty much all of the dialogue, or very large sections of it, were taken directly out of the book, whether they were said by that character or not, but the dialogue was quite good. This one, uh, so that one, that leads to of the uh, uh, 69 possible points, uh, 57. So that's, or 32, sorry. That was, that was funny, that was, that was a bad fail. Uh, my discretionary point, this one didn't necessarily get it. Um, it wasn't objectionable of a movie. Like, I would, if someone else wanted to see it, I would be perfectly willing to sit down and watch it again. I don't know that I would personally seek it out to watch again because I have seen better versions of Persuasion as far as the uh, story and adaptation side of it goes. There's uh, one that I'm thinking of which is really really spot on with the story but the uh, <laughs> cinematography and stuff suffers a little more. But I'm actually more willing to sit through that because I'm there for the story not necessarily um, just the way it looks. Uh, so my final score for this one is uh, 57 out of 100 or 5.7 out of 10. So it's, I would say it is worth watching. Um, it's not a terribly long one. It's only about 93 minutes or so and that's including your uh, end credits which just has some bird sounds playing over it which is actually kind of nice. So I, I would recommend it. Um, if you don't have time for some other ones, but we'll, we'll get further into that. Um, it was, a, I think it was a worthwhile watch. But yeah, so that's my thoughts on it. Uh, let me, uh, know what yours are. We'll, I'll have to do a lot more things. I think I'm also going to have to do a, uh, plot breakdown of Persuasion in just a video by itself of the novel because it's not very well known. Uh, it is a very good story. It's decently short. Um, this is a version of it that my younger sister got me. So you can see it's not that thick of a book, but the other thing with this one is that, uh, doo -doo -doo, if I can do it, uh, this much of it is just talking about uh, the time period of Jane Austen and some societal things at the time of this uh, writing, some things about the Navy. So this is actually all that is uh, persuasion right here. So it's it's not a long book, like, at the speed I read, I can get through this in uh, a day and a little bit, maybe. Provided I have nothing else going on. But it's it's a very light read. If you haven't had much exposure, exposure to Jane Austen, I would actually recommend it. It showcases a lot of her style. It's not perhaps as sparkly with the wit as maybe Pride and Prejudice is, but I think it's a decent on the shorter side read. So thank you for watching. I remain as ever till the next time we meet the Austin Reviewer. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more content, share with your friends to help my channel gain a bit more exposure. I would appreciate it if you would have a look at my Patreon. It's not required by any means, but it does help to support me and just allow me to make more of these videos and put them out on a more regular basis. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.